It's time for the bride to die. We're gonna kick it off with As the Flower Withers in 1992. You can tell this is like any band. This is when the band is getting their feet wet and sad. <laughs> it's raw production, but you know what? It kind of works. I do love the doomy death metal vibes on this album, especially yep. on the track Sear Me. I love Aaron's death growls. Yeah, dude. On Forever People, dude, he just sounds so evil, man. And, you know, he keeps that up throughout his entire three-decade-long metal career. Mm -hmm. The vibes of death metal on this album really do work. Like, check this out. Although it's just kind of an okay record. I don't really reach for it. I respect it though. Yeah. Like no, I'm right there with you. Basically like B minus like end of B territory. Yeah. It, this is unique for the time. You know, you had bands like Paradise Lost, Anathema, My Dying Bride, all kind of toying with this sort of sound. So this is really one of the foundational records, but definitely not one I reach for either. Turn Loose the Swans in 1993. I cannot stress enough how important this metal album is to me, especially on like my formative years as a musician. It is easily one of the best My Dying Bride albums, if not the best, depending on who you talk to. Aaron's voice on here is probably some of the best in his entire career. And it's what made me fall in love with this band. One of the heaviest moments like ever in a Doom song is in The Crown of Sympathy. This album is genuinely sad, horrifically sad. It's just so good, dude. The pacing is amazing. This is just showcases that they were on like a trajectory following up that momentum. They just wanted to get after it and they created something beautiful. Yeah, it's lightning in a sad bottle and the atmosphere on here, like across the board with the long songs. I see. They don't feel long, like with the wide open church organs and the violins and low baritone vocals filling out that space. It is just pure magic. This is my S tier, dude. Angel and the Dark River, you're dark. Yeah, it's <laughs> Another album that I have an immense soft spot for, and it's located in that little bowl on my head. <laughs> I listened to this album so many times throughout my younger years. This is a record that captivated me. Their ability to take compositions and build on the same structures and melodies is uncanny. Like, listen to the cry of mankind. This is the first band that I was like introduced to that used like violins, especially in Doom. Unfortunately, there are some kind of dud songs on here. This is like a hard B plus for me. Yeah, I have it at like A minus. I really do think The Cry of Mankind is like one of the best songs they've ever written. Dude. Maybe even in the Doom genre. Yeah, it really is. That is like a pinnacle of what it means to be low, slow, but still interesting and still like emotionally captivating. Dude, it's 13 minutes of that. <laughs> yeah. But it works. It, it's so good. Yeah, stick it at like B plus. I think that's fair. Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
Now, this is an album that I feel like a lot of people kind of skipped. And you know what? It's really good. It doesn't get enough credit, in my opinion. It's solid. It's got great 90s production on it. And that's like Gods of the Sun that was released in 1996. One of my favorite tracks in their whole discography is actually on this record. And that's A Kiss to Remember. This mm. verse is fucking infectious. One of my favorite things too in Doom is when Doom bands take that like mid-tempo rock vibe with the melodic guitars. Yeah, I have a lot of nostalgia for this record. This was the record that I was listening to quite a bit as a kid um, between that and The Angel in the Dark River. It was like one of those albums that just really captured me. And it, it's not their best. It's a little long, but there are some awesome songs on here. This is essential listening 90s doom. This is when the band two started playing with like long emotional instrumental compositions, like in My Fallen Angel, great tune. Like a thief in the night. Solid dude, I put it at B. Yeah, hard B. Thirty four point seven eight eight percent complete. It sounds like it's about thirty five percent complete. I am not a fan of this album at all. There's a lot of really weird experimentation on it. That's just kind of downright annoying on the ear at times. There's also like a lot of strange Nine Inch Nail influence. Stabbing westward kind of sound mm -hmm. at times. It's, it sounds very strange to me, a Doom band, especially a Doom band like My Dying Bride. Playing with this, I get it. It's the late 90s. It was very popular then, Wicked but it popular. is a big miss. No, he was I think this band does weird very well because they are highly unique. They're very quirky. Aaron has a quirky voice, you know, and they mm -hmm. just approach the music with that sort of idiosyncrasy very much like in full blast. I just don't think that they needed to do this record. And I'll say that about another one of their records later on in their catalog. I don't ever like reach for this. I don't think anybody does. And their counterparts, Paradise Lost, was doing a lot of experimentation in this time period. It's true. You know, they were playing with like that alternative sort of sound. Mm -hmm. And Anathema was doing the same thing, but they were like doing it well. You know, not industrial, but they were playing with alternative like Alice in Chains kind of yeah. vibes, you know. Not a good album, D tier. A lot of people really like this record a lot. I kind of get it, sort of. First of all, I was happy to hear that the band started moving back towards the Doom sound. This came out in 1999, so it was not a very long break. There are songs on this that are very lovable. Like, She Is Dark is a great tune. There's something really funny about this record though, and I'm probably gonna ruin it for people. <laughs> Aaron's voice, the way that they mixed it on this record, he sounds just like Ha uh, from the Jungle Book, the Disney fucking movie. <laughs> He doesn't really sound like this normally. I don't know. It's just so much sibilance that yeah. he sounds like a snake. Yeah, this is my least favorite performance from Aaron. I like that this is a return to form from them. You know, the riffs are here. I don't really care for this record very much. Yeah. It's weird because a lot of people like it. Yeah, I have it at like C minus basically. Yeah. All right, we're in agreement. C tier. into 2001 where I was in high school and angsty kind of the dreadful hours this is where my dying bride found their footing again and I was very happy to hear that Boy. 
great album where they still did do quite a bit of experimentation, right? But in all the ways of their brand of sad. This album's varied enough too, to keep it interesting throughout. It's a lot of people's favorites and I get that. Very cohesive, pretty fucking heavy too. Like check out A Cruel Taste of Winter. Pretty good album, B -tier. Yeah, this is their like most epic album, I think to to that date, it was their longest, just over an hour or so. And there's some really classic tracks on here that will captivate their fans, will be a central part of their live, you know, gigging. So yeah, a solid, solid B. Songs of Darkness, Words of Light, released in 2004. Fantastic production on this album for early 2000s. I love how the church organ sounds on this record, especially with those like contrasted against like the heavy burly guitar tone. Mm -hmm. The wreckage of flesh in particular sounds amazing. Raise the poor, cast I have. There's some moments too where the band is playing with sludge and it just works so well with Aaron's clean vocal tone on this album. My Wine and Silence in particular is a great example of this. I can't tell how I feel. This is easily B plus, A minus tier for me. There's just more classic songs on here. Both of those songs that you named are utterly insane in their own way. And there's always like little pieces that like you can just grab onto that Andrew Craig hand just writes. He is a riff machine and we'll talk a little bit more about him next. Super huge influence on how I write guitar harmonies and riffs in general. Mm -hmm. Love you, bro. Line of Deathless Kings. A lot of people actually don't like this yeah, album. I don't think it's very highly rated in the Which in is the weird because it's, it's fucking awesome. It's an incredible album from this band. If you hated it back then, go back and revisit it because you might not be remembering it correctly. From the first track to Remain Tombless, it has easily one of their most infectious choruses that they've ever written in their entire discography. They also work in heavy riffing with awesome keyboard melodies. Yeah. Like it'll be like chugs with like piano melodies in between. Mm. Like in I Cannot Be Loved. The guitar work in general on this album is locked the fuck in with the vocals in particular. It sounds amazing. This is a violin less my Dying Bride, which some people like scoff at, but the keys like completely make up for it. And the frickin' riffs, dude. An overlooked monument, dude. This is my S tier. Dude, the album art is awesome too. I have a shirt and uh, of, of that album art and I love it. <laughs> you have for Lies I Sire, the violin makes a return. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Which is great. Mm -hmm. Released in 2009, it's a welcome addition. I love in particular the interplay of the violin and the guitars on My Body A Funeral. The production sounds great here yeah. too. I love Aaron's spoken word parts on this album and the growling voice he uses during those parts is kind of new, but it sounds pretty sick. Life is like a carnival. My body is Good album. I don't know why I don't revisit it more. I'm in like that same boat. I'm in like a B minus ish tier mainly only because I don't tend to revisit it more, but there's some really cool tracks on this one. They have such good material that this one kind of gets lost here and there. They but. also have like a thousand albums. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that are three, totaling 3,000 hours basically of yeah, music. Yeah, at least. <laughs> the bottom is should be. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. Okay.
Eventa, released in 2011. If you go into this album expecting My Dying Bride, you will be disappointed. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people were, and that's one of the reasons why this album is usually rated so low. On the contrary, it is a pretty awesome like soundtrack, soundscape, like mm -hmm. poem, basically. I think it would be very cool to see that performed in like an orchestra hall or something like that with spoken word. Mm -hmm. But as a My Dying Bride album, not very good. I would put it in D2. I absolutely miss Andrew and, and Andrew and Aaron are the two links that make My Dying Bride what it is. It's very cool. It gives me like big like remix vibes, you know, motifs that you recognize. Oh, that's from Cry of Mankind. Oh, that's from Sear Me, you know. And they kind of come in and out, but it's just very haphazard. It's like for super fans, basically. And it's cool to throw it. Like if you're going to write poetry, probably throw it on. It's a good idea. Write some good poems. Yeah. You can poem it out. <laughs> <laughs> Above or below 34.788%. They're both in the same trash yeah. can. The map of all of our failures. My map is pretty fucking big. Of failures? Yeah. <laughs> Some of the best production out of their entire catalog mm -hmm. is, is on this album. Across the sea to I love the way Aaron wrote the vocal harmonies too on this mm. album. A lot of experimentation with that that you'll see him doing a lot more in their later catalog too. The Poorest Waltz is probably one of their biggest songs. Really good album. Plenty of people love it. I can see why. I still throw it on from time to time, but not my favorite. I put it at B+. I think that this was one of their best return to forms after kind of having like a miss album, you know, coming off of Aventa the next year later for them to come out with this was totally unexpected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd put it like the top of B. I'd even go A-. minus. Feel the misery in 2015. This album is heavy as hell, dude. And the mm. production again, just sounds amazing here. I love the album artwork too. It's probably one of my favorites out of their entire catalog. I love their choice too, to just start the album with the killer riff and my father left forever. Listen to this. Aaron's death growls on this album too sound so good. I love the contrast with like the really slow double bass parts like in To Shiver in Empty Halls. I revisit this album all the time. B plus, A minus territory for me easily. I really love that they weren't afraid to rope in some of those mid paced and even like short tracks for this band, like A Thorn of Wisdom and I Almost Loved You. They're, they're mixing it up a little bit and that's cool. Hard B plus for sure. Now, this album was pretty big when it came out. It was a big return to form for the band, and that's The Ghost of Orion in 2020. It is easily one of their best records, bar none. But unfortunately, the album was surrounded by the COVID-19 pandemic. And also, you know, Aaron was going through some pretty tragic things at the time with his daughter being sick. You can feel the sadness in particular on this album in a lot of different ways. The performances on this record are absolutely stellar. They're infectious melodies from start to finish, especially in the single, Your Broken Shore. Your broken shore. 
I love this album. Still spin it consistently to this day. A tier for me. Aaron sounds insane, dude. And we w had the uh, great opportunity to chat with Aaron. He's just a great guy. He was yeah. a great guy to talk to. And we learned a lot about his performance, about the courting sessions that he went through. So be sure to check that, that video out right here. This was lightning in a bottle, really. And I, the sadness and sorrow is palpable. Like their early, early stuff. You know, like this is a genuinely sad record. Love it. Probably top of A for me. If Turn Loose the Swans didn't exist, this might be my S tier. Oh, damn. But So that leaves 2024's Immortal Binding. Happy to say this album is amazing for a 30 year career of this band, them to come out swinging still. Pretty impressive. The production is some of their best yet in their entire catalog, mm -hmm. especially with just keeping the heaviness and groove throughout the album like in Thornwick Him. Aaron's vocals just sound amazing on this album, and it's highly impressive for a band this far into their career. I don't understand like how he has just been getting better and better and better as a vocalist. You know, you can tell that he's very dedicated to his craft, dedicated to being a little bit more different, a little bit better, a little bit more efficient, like every outing. It comes across so well. A lot of bands, when they're this far into their career, they're in the twilight, you know, and for them to come out and stay this strong, the apocalyptus like might be one of their best songs dude like hands down I love the way this album ends too. It cuts off and it just stops, you know, and like you feel it wrapped up and concluded really nicely. This is one of their better records, yeah. I'm happy to hear too, the band experiments a ton with their early death metal tones. Aaron's growls still sound fucking awesome. I'm happy to say that it withers my heart in a good way to hear a band that's so important in the doom genre doing this well so far into their career. Unfortunately, I think it's a little bit lower than Ghost of Orion for me, but that might be because I've had so much time to sit with that other record. Maybe time will put this one higher, but it is a strong as hell outing. Easy A minus B plus. I agree with you 100%. Let us know down in the comments what's your favorite My Dying Bride album. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button. It really helps us out and check out some of our other videos right here. Go with the gods, Forge Mates. The apocalyptist awaits.